Hey gang, back with part two of three. So let's pick it up with looking at tanks. So fermentation tanks on the upper right here is a nice picture of some concrete fermenters. Those are um, commonly used still in bulk facilities. And when I worked at Bullyu Vineyard, I went up to Hopland once a week to check our fermentations and cement tanks, which look just like this. If you went up to the upper floor, uh, one floor above this, you'd probably see open tops to these fermenters. In other words, they're like big uh, concrete swimming pools. And, um, and you'd run pipes through them, stainless steel pipes, to carry hot or cold water for cooling and heating your fermentation. So those are concrete. You can, obviously we normally use stainless steel these days, um, but concrete is coming back as I'll show you in a sec. Uh, wood fermenters are also still out there and are, as are food grade plastic fermenters, especially for home fermentation. So in addition, we're talking about red wine. We have to consider that some people are using barrels these days. So barrels are labor intensive for red wine fermentations, probably obviously, because you've got to get the skins inside the barrel. So typically what happens is the head of the barrel is removed and the barrels are full filled with must and then the, the head of the barrel can be replaced. So obviously labor intensive, but some winemakers like the results because the phenolic compounds extracted from the wood often complement the phenolic compounds that are in the grape skins. And you get some complexes formed between those phenolics that uh, stabilize color and sometimes give a nice mouthfeel to the wine. So. Um, so you'll see, we may see that more and more for high-end wines. Concrete used to be the industry standard. The problem is it's hard to clean. So you can, anytime you have a porous um, wall of your fermenter, you're going to get spoilage organisms in there. And um, that's where things like, um, well, it's, you, need a, you need a sanitizer that's going to somehow um, penetrate those porous um, parts of your fermenter. So steam often works really well because the heat can penetrate and kill microbes that are squirreled away in the little crevices in the concrete or in wood, for example. Um, but wood is, but both of those are problematic because oftentimes many organisms don't get killed. So it's tough to clean. Uh, cements is tough to clean. It also um, retains color, so you have to dedicate them uh, a fermenter to red or white, one or the other, because uh, you'll get some red in the concrete, which will come out into your white wine. One of the new uses of concrete is in fermentation eggs. So people are experimenting with these. There's a manufacturer right in Petaluma that makes these eggs. You, some people get them imported from France, but obviously shipping costs are high because they're very expensive. But you get a uh, manhole in the bottom just like you normally would <clears throat> but um, what you don't have and you, have, you do have a manhole cover at the top but what you don't have to do with these is you don't have to pump them over or punch them down and the reason for that is that they create a vortex so there's actually a movement in here because of the as heat is rising in these concrete tanks it actually creates a vortex and it, it creates movement within the tank such that they're basically self-mixing. So people think that that maintains more even temperature, which I'm sure it does. And of course, you're saved from the labor of having to punch down or pump over. People think that concrete also imparts oxygen. And so we've talked about how yeast need a little bit of oxygen to maintain their cell membranes such that uh, they're tolerant to high alcohols. So if you can get a little oxygen from the concrete, then um, that can maintain some, um, some yeast health too. Some people believe that it gives, that the tanks give greater body. Um, and so you get body like you get from a barrel, but without oak flavor. You tend to get low, lower alcohols in these. I'm not sure that there's a lot of science as to why, but if there is more oxygen in these, that would uh, lead to lower alcohol because yeast can actually use the oxygen to um, make energy for themselves without making alcohol. 
So we haven't looked at that in this class, but there are alternative pathways. The yeast can either take oxygen and consume sugar to make energy, or in the absence of oxygen, they can take sugar and make alcohol. So if there's a little extra oxygen in these tanks, it's likely that yeast take that oxygen, they use it to make energy, and as a result, they don't make as much ethanol. So could be the reason for lower alcohols. So, and like the last point says here, the rising CO2 creates movement, that vortex inside the tank, eliminating the need for pump overs. So the next slide is a typical red fermentation tank. I think we've, you're pretty familiar with these at this point. We haven't talked about a couple of items on here. There's the sample pet cock right there where you can pull a sample. So if you're giving a nice tour of your wine cellar and you've got that tour group coming by, you can just take a glass with you and pull a sample from that pet cock and share it with people. Um, there's a racking door that um, you'll use when you're racking wines that have a lot of sediment in the bottom. Sometimes what you'll do is you'll, you'll take uh, wine off of the racking valve and when the wine gets low enough and it gets to this level here below the racking door, then you can actually open that racking door and then you can look inside the tank and you can see the level of sediment typically in the bottom of the tank and so you can stop racking when you get close to that sediment. So that's one nice advantage of having a racking door. The bottom door is the one out of which you will shovel uh, pumice and we'll talk about that a little later. And then there's the large bottom valve, also called transfer valve. So typical fermentation tank. Variable capacity tanks have a removable lid and you can um, actually have a lid on your tank. So you can remove the lid for open top fermentations. When your fermentation is complete, you can put the lid back on. That allows you to button up the tank if you want to do some extended maceration at the end of fermentation. In other words, keep the finished wine in contact with the skins for some length of time. Um, you can also use these tanks as a storage tank because you have that lid that you can put on there. People don't like them too much um, because they do tend to allow a little more oxygen in. Um, they tend to leak, in other words, um, more than a, a sealed tank. So there's there are trade-offs there. But it is, um, it is nice if you want to have a lot of um, open top fermentations. The problem with buying a lot of open top fermenters is they take up floor space and you cannot use those for storage of wine later in the season. So by having a, a, a lid that you can place on them, you can potentially use those for storage as well. Okay, so the next slide is actually a, um, a, a clicker question, which, and since we're not in class, uh, we obviously can't do this. So uh, go ahead and look this over and let's see, I should, uh, what I might do here is go ahead and insert a slide with the answers to the clicker questions. So you can read these on your own, um, stop this, and I am going to um, go ahead and put the answers on a slide following. And so don't look at this. <laughs> I don't know how this is gonna work. Um, I'm kind of doing this on the fly. Um, but uh, the answers to the questions will be here. In other words, gang, what you might do is just watch these um, clicker question slides on your own, and the answers are going to be uh, following the four clicker slides. So here's the first one. There's a the second one. You can pause so you can read this. There's the third one. You can pause it again. And there's the fourth one. And there are the four answers to the clicker question, so you can pause that and read these as well. Okay, moving on to the start of fermentation. So we may proceed fermentation with a cold soak period. So cold soak is just soaking at cold temperatures your juice in contact with the skins. And this is often done for Pinot Noir um, and also, uh, and sometimes with other varietals as well. The idea would be to extract certain things from the skins, especially color, and the extraction 
fr with um, from the skins by juice is different than the extraction from the skins by wine during fermentation. During fermentation, you're going to have heat. And you're, going to, you're going to have alcohol building up. Both of those change the extraction, and both of those increase extraction from the skins. But the change is what we're interested in because in cold soak, you can get certain compounds, certain flavors, certain things extracted from the skin that will be different than what you get during fermentation. And lots of winemakers like the extraction they get during um, cold soak. So cold soak can, would usually be four to five days. What you would do is uh, put a, a lid on top of your fermenter. Uh, people even do a, do um, cold soak in half ton picking bins, uh, just putting a lid on top. You would throw in some dry ice when you put your must into the picking bin. So you, in other words, you'd, you'd harvest your grapes, bring them in, crush them, pump some of the must back into your picking bin, put a lid on top, before you, before you close the lid, you'd put some dry ice in there, which is just frozen CO2. And the CO2 then would come off your picking bin and would fill the bin with CO2, which would protect your must from, out, from uh, oxygen. So you'd let your must sit there three or four days. Oftentimes fermentation may, will start slowly during the cold soak period uh, using um, uh, indigenous yeast. If you want to knock down the indigenous yeast, you could um, add some additional um, sulfur dioxide to try and knock down those indigenous yeast. At the end of cold soak, then you'd go ahead and inoculate, most likely, with um, some kind of added yeast and, um, and or you allow the indigenous yeast to do the fermentation. So after cold soak, you, you'd, uh, or, or preceding cold soak, you would mix the tank and then once the tank is nicely mixed, then you test your sugar, pH, TA, temperature, etc., and maybe your yeast available nitrogen. Um, you want to do this after mixing the tank because then you get a, a, an accurate sample as to your sugar levels. Um, in other words, you may have pockets of higher or lower sugar. If you sampled one of those pockets, you'd, you'd get a, a distorted view of your sugar, pH, TA, etc. So you mix it, then do your testing. Um, and then you may do cold soak after that. At some point, then you're going to inoculate with yeast, unless you're doing the native fermentation. Um, you're going to add nutrients, typically after the yeast lag period, like we talked about. You can also add oak adjuncts at this point. So some people will add oak here. I, I mentioned just earlier today um, about the advantage of doing red fermentations in barrels. If you add oak, you could add sawdust, oak chips, oak planks those have the potential to impart to your fermentation some oak character, some oak phenolics, and so you could get some of the, the advantages of fermenting in an oak barrel without having the labor intensity of taking a, a head off a barrel and filling it with red must. So you can get some uh, more stable color, um, some better aroma, many believe, less vegetative character. So you can add oak adjuncts here. Moving on, um, so th this this mentions one more uh, point about cold soak. Um, if you allow cold soak to happen, you can extract remaining sugar from any raisins, um, and again, that'll give you an accurate sugar number. So, in other words, if you had a if you had a Zinfandel, for example, that was unevenly ripe and there were some raisins in the clusters, if you give those raisins a little time to uh, soak up with the rest of the juice, the sugar will come out of the raisins and then it'll give you an accurate view of the total sugar in your tank. The reason that's important is you may want to add water before fermentation um, if the sugar is too high. If the sugar is too high, you might end up with a stuck fermentation at the end because your ethanol will um, the ethanol level will become too high after the yeast convert all that sugar to alcohol. So you want to know that in advance. You can add water if needed. Um, then pump overs. Pump overs, couple, two choices have a big impact on flavor. So frequency and then the volume you pump over. So typically if a winemaker is writing a work order, they're going to tell the seller people how often to do pump overs or punch downs. Um, 
and what kind of volume to uh, pump over. You might be half or a full volume of the tank. That will vary. A lot of winemakers will keep an eye on the fermentation as it goes along, as they taste it, as they see the cap changing, they will change the level of um, either frequency or volume or both. So in other words, if you have a 10, uh, a 10,000 gallon fermenter, you might take half of that and pump it over. And if you know your pump, pumping rate, you know that you pump over half of that in 20 minutes. So your work order will say, pump tank two for 20 minutes and three times a day, say, and then you may change that as things go along. And that's the last point here. You will um, taste daily. Um, I talked about how Clay Moritzen described it because last semester we went up to Moritzen Winery and Clay talked a lot about cap management and how he, he'll keep an eye on that every day. Um, as you get toward the end of fermentation, the cap, there's not as much CO2 coming off of the fermentation because your fermentation is slowing down. That means there's not as much CO2 to push the cap to the top of the tank and your cap, the nature of your cap will change as, as the cap starts to sink, you don't need to do as much in the way of pump over or punch down. Okay, next slide. Um, there's a nice video here and I recommend you watch it. Um, it um, it's by John Levenberg, a winemaker in Ohio and New York State. Uh, he was a classmate of mine at Davis. It's a very informative video. I'm talking about some of the winemaker decisions that uh, have to do with pump over and maceration. Maceration is just the contact of skins with juice or with wine or with a fermenting juice turning into wine and it, maceration can include cold soak when the skins are in contact with the juice. Can, it can include uh, all the pump over and pump and punch downs we do during fermentation to increase juice or wine contact with skins and it can include extended maceration after fermentation is done. So check out that video when you get a chance. Um, oak adjuncts I mentioned, I already said so sawdust. Um, oak flour is very finely ground sawdust. Oak chips, um, about six pounds per ton um, is, is a ballpark if you want a ballpark at which to start, but the smaller the chip, the less you need. And typically, you do, you, winemakers would give it a try and taste as you go along and keep an, eye, keep an eye on how much taste you're getting from the oak adjuncts. And then next year, you can, you, or you could always um, remove some of the oak, um, especially if you keep it in a bag or uh, if it's in the form of planks, it's easily removed. And then next year, you, you can make a decision about do you want to go with less than six pounds per ton or more, et cetera. Next slide, um, starting fermentation. Temperature not too hot, not too cold. Uh, we talked about yeast being added within 10 degrees Fahrenheit of the tank temperature. The temp during fermentation shouldn't go above probably around 90. You can go hotter. The problem is if you go too hot, it, there's a chance that the temperature will take off and get out of hand and then the yeast will die. Not too cold, you'll get poor extraction in red wines if it's cold, so you typically ferment hotter than you will with white wines. Um, if it's too cold, cold your fermentation is going to go very slowly. So ideally, you'll, one ballpark would be start around 70 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit and peak in the 80 to 90 degrees range. Um, if you, it, you obviously need to be able to cool your tank if you're going to cool off the fermenter. If you're in small picking bins, you can often move those bins outside during at night. Um, or keep them in a cold cellar at night to cool them off. Uh, oftentimes you'll, you'll move those outside in the sun during the day to, to get the fermentation going and heat, heat, heat up those white picking bins if you're fermenting in those. One thing that to watch out for that's on the uh, lower right here in the slide is that if you view from the top of the tank, um, there can be pockets of hot and cold. So you can have a lot hotter temperature in the middle of the tank than you do at the, at, around the outside, especially if you're, if you're cooling with a, with, a, with a cooling jacket on the outside of the tank. So if you want to get an accurate um, temperature reading, you really need to mix the tank, but just be aware of that. Rack and return. So rack and return is a process that's used during fermentation. And what it means is removing red juice to a second tank, leaving the skins behind, and then you return the juice to the first tank. So here's a little diagram. You'd have a fermenting wine here in a tank, CO2 coming off, you got a nice cap forming. You would take either off the, off the racking valve or the bottom valve, 
Um, if you take off the bottom valve, you can remove, you'll get some seeds because the seeds will be down at the bottom of the tank down here. So you get some seeds coming out if you come off the bottom valve, more seeds. And if you come off the racking valve, you'll get less seeds. Either way, what people often do is they go to a secondary container. So this would be our secondary container here. And they'll pump through a screen. So this would be the screen here, kind of outlined in blue. And that screen will capture some of your seeds. If you want to pull the seeds out because you feel like seeds are giving you some harsh flavors or some harsh tannins, this would be a time you can remove those. So people play with levels of seeds and they remove them in this step. Then the wine is pumped from that secondary container over to another tank. So it goes over to another tank, gets pumped in there, and oftentimes it's aerated. So at this point then you would aerate if you want some more, some oxygen exposure. If, in other words, you may want some oxygen in your fermentation either to increase yeast health or to help the phenolics soften by polymerizing some of those phenolics. So again, you get to know your vineyard, you get to know your grapes, and you, know, you, you, you probably know from year to year whether how much aeration you want to provide to a certain um, batch of Cabernet, for example. So you could aerate here. Um, on the next um, slide it, it talks a little bit more about this so the options are spraying the red juice into the second tank from the top to do the aeration um, if more air, oops I didn't mean to move that all around what I wanted to do is grab a pen there we go so we do some aeration right there um, de la sta would be the um, the French um, word for that pump rack and return uh, with aeration some people use that term even without aeration um, but rack and return would be generally how we refer to it. And again, you, you'd have options to remove seeds. Um, Bruce Zocklein at University of Virginia, who's a great enologist, uh, did some research on this and suggested better fruit flavor, uh, more tannins, softer tannins, sorry, and more stable color with rack and return. So uh, Leahy was the author from 2000. You can Google that if you want to look at that paper. You can aerate during uh, pump overs, um, and one way to do that is to, uh, there's several ways to do it. One way is to use this venturi here that you'd put in the line as you pump it through. Air is sucked in here by the lower pressure as, uh, as you pump through this part of the venturi, um, and you'd get some air in your line. The other way you can do it is just when you do a pump over, pump into a bin that has a screen in the bottom, and you you basically spray the wine into this to the bin, um, either either just to the bottom of the bin, in which case you'll get some oxygen, or across a screen, in which case you'll get more oxygen. It's another way you can aerate during pump overs. Rotary fermenters; those are not used as much as the people thought they might when they were purchased. They're expensive. Um, what you can do is rotate um, the fermentation so you don't have to do pump overs and punch downs. So it's less labor intensive. I mean, that's good news, but they're really expensive to buy these things. So cost is a disadvantage and the potential for over extraction. So most people I know who have these use them as storage tanks right now. I'm sure there's some people who still use them, especially in, in high volume wineries where uh, you don't have the labor to do all the punch downs but you tend to get that over extraction. One thing you can do is use them initially and then pump or, or press the wine and the juice, combination of wine and juice off of the skins before the juice is finished fermenting. And then you eliminate extraction. And of course you don't have to do any pump overs because you've pressed the skins off of the juice slash wine. So that's one way you can use a rotary fermenter. Other methods of cap management, you can hold the skins submerged. So if you look up into this tank here, we're looking through the uh, manhole, manhole at the bottom. You'll see that screen midway up the tank. You can normally move that screen up and down, and those will, that'll hold the skin submerged. The other thing you can do is you can roll the tank, meaning you can turn over the juice inside the tank, the juice and the cap, by, by bubbling inert gas through it. You, that the, the downside there is the cost of the inert gas, um, but it's another way of turn, to turn the tank and manage your cap without doing a pump over or a punch down. On the right here is just another look. This is a look from the top, actually looking down at one of those screens inside the tank uh, for holding the cap down. All right, three more slides here. And um, getting skins to the press 
if you've ever shoveled the press, you know that it's difficult. It's a very dangerous job because of all the CO2 in the skins. And so you have to be very careful going into a tank uh, that has skins in it. CO2 is heavier than air, and so it can blanket the bottom of the tank and suffocate people who are in there. So there are very uh, strict laws about going into tanks. Tanks are considered confined spaces, and, and you need an entry permit to go in there. So your winery will have a permit. You have to be trained and you've got to go in uh, in pairs, last bullet point here, and with a safety harness. In other words, one person stays out, one person goes in to shovel, the person outside uh, can pull the person inside out with a safety harness if um, that person passes out because of too much CO2. Typically you'll put a fan at the top of the tank too to blow fresh air in there to keep um, CO2 levels down. And you, usually you'll test the atmosphere. You should always test the atmosphere and then keep track of it to make sure there's adequate oxygen. You can have a little handheld oxygen meter just reach inside the tank, make sure there's enough oxygen to go in and then, um, main, and then check to make sure that the, that, that the oxygen stays high enough while you're in there. A respirator doesn't help because there's no oxygen. So you can't use a gas mask, in other words. If there's no oxygen to breathe, gas mask doesn't help you. So. Be sure you train all your folks because this is a it, it is a place where people definitely get hurt. Here's a sample permit and there's a warning sign on the outside of a tank, danger confined space, a permit. You can't read that here, low resolution, but you'd have a sample permit that would look like that. And then finally pressing reds off. We don't need a press aid. We don't need the yeast hulls that we talked about with white wines because the skins um, are drier than at the start. So you don't get skins caking together like you do with uh, white wines with fresh, freshly crushed juices. So you don't need yeast hulls. Um, post pressing then, you, you know, press your wine off the skins. Post pressing the tank goes, or wine goes into tank for t settling. Typically, you'd maybe let it settle, get some of the gross lees, the gross dead yeast cells out of the wine, and then rack it into a barrel for aging. Um, so, and we did this last, this, this bullet point just refers to last semester when we had Pinot Noir, and we put it in, we pressed it off, put it in the tank, let it settle, and then racked it to barrels uh, a few days later. Um, we would adjust SO2 at this point if malolactic fermentation is complete. And we'll talk about malolactic fermentation in part three of the video today. Um, you can do malolactic in tank or barrel, but you don't want to adjust SO2 until the malolactic is complete because of course, bacteria are very sensitive to SO2. And you, if, if you add too much SO2, your malolactic will not happen. And, um, and you may never be able to get it to go if you add too much SO2. So that's it for today, end of part two. Thanks for listening. Tune in soon and I'll get part three online. Thanks.